This is episode number 37 with Gretchen Rubin. Welcome to the Melissa Ambrosini Show. I'm your host, Melissa, best-selling author of Mastering Your Mean Girl, and I'm here to remind you that love is sexy, healthy is liberating, and wealthy isn't a dirty word. Each week, I'll be getting up close and personal with thought leaders from around the globe to uncover the habits, mindsets, tools, and rituals that they have used to become world so that you can create epic change in your own life and become the best version of yourself possible. Are you ready, beautiful? Gretchen is one of the most thought-provoking and influential writers on habits and happiness. She is the author of several books, including the blockbuster New York Times bestsellers, Better Than Before, The Happiness Project, and Happier at Home. She has an enormous readership, both in print and online, and her books have sold almost 3 million copies worldwide in more than 30 languages. That is amazing. On her popular weekly podcast, Happier with Gretchen Rubin, she discusses good habits and happiness. She provides surprising insights and practical advice drawn from cutting-edge research, ancient wisdom, and her own observations about how we can make our lives better than before. Fast Company named Gretchen to its list of most creative people in business, and she's a member of Oprah's Super Soul 100. She has been interviewed by Oprah and walked arm in arm with the Dalai Lama. And in today's episode, we chat about how she became an expert on happiness, how to become happier and her 21 strategies for happiness, the difference between habits and rituals, why you need to understand the roles of a treat and reward, the essential seven happiness habits, the four tendencies and why you struggle to form habits even if you really want to. This was super interesting. How making your bed can actually make you happier. Yep, you heard me correctly. The two questions to ask yourself to uncover what makes you truly happy. Why if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. Why it's important to be nice to everyone, plus so much more. And for everything that we mention in today's episode, you can check out in the show notes, and that will be at melissaambrosini.com forward slash 37. And without further ado, let's bring on the amazing happiness expert, Gretchen Rubin. Welcome, Gretchen. It is so great to have you here. But before we dive in, can you please tell us what you had for breakfast this morning? I had three scrambled eggs, which is what I have every single day. Mmm, delicious. Now, can you take us back and tell us your story and your journey on how you got to being an expert on happiness? Well, it was a very inconspicuous moment of my life. I was stuck on a city bus in the pouring rain, and I had one of those rare opportunities for reflection that you don't often get in the tumult of everyday life. And I thought, um, you know, what do I want from life anyway? And I thought, well, I want to be happy. But I didn't spend any time thinking about whether I was happy or how I could be happier. So I decided I should have a happiness project. And um, I ran out to the library the next day and got a huge stack of books about happiness. And um, at first, it was just going to be my own project for myself. I often will get obsessed with subjects and do a ton of research for just my own pleasure. But this was such a vast, fascinating subject that before long, I decided I wanted to write a whole book about it. And at that time, I was just finishing up my biography of John Kennedy. And so um, I decided, well, I'll write my next book about my happiness project. And at that time, was that when you were a lawyer? No. The the Happiness Project was actually my fourth book. So I had switched from law to writing many years before. A lot of people think that those things happened at the same time. um, But I had actually been writing books for for some time by then. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, so you're sitting on the bus, you're having this realization, and then you go out to the library, you get a whole bunch of books, and then what happens? Well, you know, what I do, and again, this is something that happens to me all the time. Right now, it's happening to me with the subject of color. I'm like obsessively researching color for no apparent good reason. Um, I'll go and I'll just start obsessively reading about things, and then I take notes. And so this is a huge part of what I do every day is read and take notes. So if, it, if something is a beautiful passage, I will take notes as sort of a quotation. Um, I have like a, a daily newsletter where I send out quotations to people, you know, I have a newsletter list because I just have all these wonderful quotations. But if I'm really interested in a subject, I'll take notes on that subject. And it's interesting because a lot of times I will take notes and it's very clear to me what I should take notes on, even if I don't even really understand why or what the relevance is to me when I'm doing it, I sort of can tell that eventually it's going to be something that I'm going to want to think about or, 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 uh, or take into consideration. So I just started taking notes and notes and notes, you know, dozens of pages of notes, then hundreds of pages of notes. And then at a certain point, I'm like, this is starting to, like, I'm starting to see how I would write a book. I start seeing how I could structure something and um, it begin, and ar- arguments begin to take form in my mind as I learn a subject better. And I'll start to see like, well, I agree with these people, but I disagree with these people. Or I think this thing is being overlooked or no one's figured out how to work this exception into the theory. And, um, and so I always start from reading and then from note taking. And then from there, that's how I get my own original ideas. Mm-hmm. Is this something that you've always done, like, you know, really gone deep into a particular subject matter and just kind of like unpacked it? That's how I kind of got into writing was I was doing this with um, the subject of power, money, fame, and sex, which was the, t- which was, became my first book, Power, Money, Fame, Sex. That was the first time where I was really seized with an idea in kind of a major way like that. Yeah. So this is something that really does happen to me, like how I engage in the world with these really strong preoccupations. Okay. So let's go back to happiness and being an expert on the topic. Can you talk about rituals and habits and the link to happiness? Like what role do daily rituals and habits play in living a happier life? Well, habits, of course, is something that I'm very preoccupied with because I wrote The Happiness Project and I wrote Happier at Home. And so I was talking to people constantly and researching constantly, how would you be happier? And I began to see that for many people, habits were a real stumbling block because there were things where it wasn't that people didn't know what would make them happier. They'd be like, yeah, I would be happier if I exercised or I'd be happier if I read more or got more sleep or quit sugar or whatever. But were, but people were unable to make a habit out of that. And I became very interested in the role that habits could play in helping us to be happier, healthier, more creative, and more productive. And so that's what led me to my book, Better Than Before, to really try to understand, well, what, how do people make or break habits? Um, and what I found is that there are 21 strategies that people can use to make or break their habits. And that's good. It sounds like a lot. Sometimes people feel like that's kind of overwhelming. But it's good because the ones that work for you, uh, Melissa, might not work for me, Gretchen. You know, we're different. And some strategies are available to us at some times in our lives and not at other times in our lives. But And, and depending on what kind of person we are, we might view habits differently and what kind of role we want, to, how we want to use them. Habits can be freeing and energizing because they get us out of decision making and using self control. So, in that way, they're very powerful, but they also um, speed time. They can also be deadening. Some people don't like the idea of habits, and so they need to think about it in a different way. Now, you talked about habits and rituals. To me, a ritual is a habit that has a transcendent meaning. So if I'm washing my hands because I always wash my hands after, you know, you know, before I eat a meal, that's just a habit. If I'm washing my hands and saying a prayer about purity and cleanliness, then that's a ritual. So um, it has to do, both are behaviors that are being repeated, but it has to do, well, is there special meaning that is assigned to that or is it just like part of your ordinary day? Mm, That's really interesting. I really like that. I've never really distinguished the difference like that. What are, I mean, you don't have to go through all 21 strategies, but can you maybe take us through a couple of them? Like what are the top five? 
Well, you know, it's hard to say that they're a top five because, as I say, some work very well for some people and don't work at all for other people. And so the most important thing I would say is you have to really begin by your with yourself. There is no magic one-size-fits-all solution that's going to work for everyone because we're different. And, and sometimes somebody will have great success with something but it won't work for someone else. And so, and I think sometimes people feel defeated or frustrated, or they sort of blame themselves for not having willpower or self-control because something's not working for them. And the people around them are like, well, you should be able to do this. And it's like, but I can't, it's not working for me. That's okay. There's a, there's 21 strategies. There's a lot of ways to do this. Um, so it's just a matter of what works for you. Now that said, there are some strategies that tend to work with just about everyone. And two of them are the twin strategies, the strategy of convenience and the strategy of inconvenience. So we are just crazily more likely to do something if it's even slightly more convenient and much less likely to do something if it's even slightly less convenient. And they've done hilarious studies on this, like, there's one study showing that people will take much less food at a salad bar if they have to use tongs instead of a spoon because like they just can't be bothered to use the tongs. So this is of something where if you don't want to if you don't want to eat ice cream, you know, in your that's in your freezer, first of all, don't buy it. Don't have it in your house. You have to go out and drive to the ice cream store to get ice cream. That's very inconvenient, so you're much less likely to do it. Or if you have to have it in your house, like put it in a bag that's tightly wrapped and put it all the way back on the shelf. So you really have to dig through things to get to that ice cream. You know, you want to make it as inconvenient as possible. If you want to go to the gym, it's worth paying a little bit more if you can afford it to go to the gym that's right across the street from your office because then you can just run across the street because even two blocks away is going to feel less convenient and that's going to make you less likely to do that. So that's something um, that works for just about everyone. Another one that can really work for people is the strategy of safeguards. And this is this is when you anticipate failure. So you think about like, okay, well, I like to exercise and I've been pretty good about the habit of exercise, but what am I going to do when I'm traveling for work? What am I going to do when I'm on vacation? What am I going to do when the weather gets bad? What am I going to do when the days get shorter? What am I going to do if I have an injury and I can't put weight on my foot? Um... What am I going to do when, um, you know, I'm, I have this new romance in my life. And so that's like throwing my weekend into it's, it's changing the shape of my weekend because now I'm accommodating somebody else's schedule. So if then, so, um, thinking about safeguards is like doing what's called if then planning. If this happens, if it's cold outside, if I'm on vacation, if I'm traveling for work, then I will do this and you plan it in advance. And that way you sort of when you're in a kind of calm, cool state, you think through how you want to um, approach a situation. And that tends to help people do a much better job. Another strategy that's good for just about everybody is the strategy of treats. And I love all the 21 strategies. They are all powerful and effective, but this is definitely the most fun strategy. And this is the idea that we should all load ourselves with healthy treats in order to be to get energy. You know, sometimes you're going through your day and you think after the day I've had I need this. I deserve this. I have to have this. You're like a cell phone that needs to get plugged into the wall to get to get a charge. And a healthy treat is a way to give yourself that feeling of being cared for and 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 a feeling of energy. But what happens and I mean I, this happens to me, it happens to most people, it's very easy to fall into the pattern of giving yourself an unhealthy treat. So unhealthy treats often include things like food and drink or shopping or screen time. You know, you stay up late till 2 a.m. watching reality TV and then you tr you're trying to make yourself feel better with some kind of treat, but in the end you just make yourself feel worse. You know, so you don't you want to um you want to make yourself feel better overall, not just at the moment. And um, and the fact is, when you give more to yourself, you can ask more from yourself. And so when you give yourself healthy treats, it's easier to do things like quit sugar or go to the gym or go to bed on time or stay patient with other people because you feel you have that sense of energy. And so I think all everybody should try to have a long list of healthy treats so that when you get that feeling, I need it, I want it, I deserve it, you can reach for something like doing a crossword puzzle um, or like one of my favorite treats is beautiful smells. Like I have a whole collection of smells and I'll just go over and like enjoy a beautiful smell and that makes me, or I'll put on a perfume that I love and that gives me kind of a little kick. Or like I love to go to the library, you know, sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, I need a treat, I'm going to go to the library. 
Um, and that's not a treat for everybody. Not everybody would consider that a treat. You know, you really have to think about, well, what would be a treat for you? Um, but the, but treats help us keep our habits because they let us um, have that wherewithal um, to ask more from ourselves and to exercise that self-mastery. Mm, what are some other examples of healthy treats? Um, well, like I know somebody who buys new music every time Apple releases new music. Um, I know a guy who he, um, he didn't even really like camping, but for some reason he loved the stuff. And so he would go to the camping store and just like, look at the things. Um, I have a friend who every morning she had to like get her whole family out the door. So she'd get dressed for work, get everybody, you know, off to school. And then she would get back in bed fully dressed and just lie there for 20 minutes. And she's like, it's the best part of my day. Um, you know, going for a walk in the park with your dog, um, sometimes like, it's, you know, screen and, and all sometimes things that are unhealthy treats for some people can be healthy treats for somebody. So maybe you have like a special television show that always makes you laugh and you just, you just love it. Um, or maybe it's like one of your favorite shows from when you were younger and you like to watch the reruns and they, it always lifts your spirits. Well, maybe you want to save it. And then when you're like, you know what, I need a little treat. I'm just going to sit down and watch one episode of the show that I love and, you know, watching it for five hours, staying up really late watching the show is probably not going to be a healthy treat. But like watching one episode um, could be a healthy treat, you know, dancing around the room um, to your favorite upbeat song. Um, but, but I've heard of people that have funny treats, like weirdly, a lot of people have told me that they love to iron. This is a treat for a lot of people. I, can't, I don't understand it, but many people have told me that. And then there are people, I know somebody whose treat is to do Latin uh, translation. I know somebody whose tra treat is to do user interface improvements. Um, so treats don't always look the way people, uh, people, other people might think that it looks. Um, like I hate doing um, like travel research. I hate doing travel research. And I have a friend like her idea of like the most delicious way to spend a half an hour is to like, think about possible destinations for the next family trip or to like, think about like, Oh, if I went to Miami, what restaurant would I go to? To me, this would not be fun, but for her, it's delightful. Um, so you really just want to think about, um, you know, what, what are the things that you actually look forward to and, um, that, that, that don't make you feel worse later. So the, so you don't want to do something in the short term that's going to make you feel worse later. So if it's something where you're like, Ooh, I really love it right this second. But tomorrow I'm going to regret it. That's not a good healthy treat. Important distinction. There's a difference between treats and rewards. A treat you get just because you want it. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to deserve it. You can have a treat anytime you want. This is just for you to have. You feel like you want a treat, you get a treat. It's very, very risky to use rewards in, in, the, in the context of habit formation. You do not want to reward yourself for a good habit. You don't want to say something like, because I went to the gym, I get to have a beer. Because I went to the gym, I get to have a scone. Because I was really good about going to bed on time, I'm going to let myself buy a pair of shoes. That really does not solidify a habit. The only kind of rewards that can work for habits are first the kind of rewards that take you deeper into a habit. So, oh my gosh, I'm doing so much yoga. I need new yoga clothes because I've got a giant hole in the crotch of my yoga pants. Okay, that's that's that is going to be that's only useful to you if you're doing yoga. Or now that I'm doing so much cooking, I really should um, buy myself a new set of knives because I can really use these set of knives. It's going to make cooking so much more pleasant for me. Okay, you can get that set of knives. Or you just think about the pleasure of the habit itself. Oh my gosh, it is such a wonderful feeling to wake up in the morning before my alarm goes off. If I can go to bed by 1030, then I just wake up naturally. And that is such a better feeling than being dragged out of a deep sleep by my alarm clock. That's a reward for my habit. And I'm really going to think about that and to reinforce the habit. But if I said something like, oh, if I go to bed at 1030 every night for seven days, then I get to have a bottle of wine. That's that that kind of teaches you that you're only doing the habit in order to get something. And often that undermines the habit formation process. So you really want to a tree you get just because you want it a reward you have to earn. So kind of stay away from the rewards if what you're trying to do is solidify a habit. Also, if it's an important habit and if it's maybe a habit that you've struggled with in the past, like let's say exercising or uh, eating more healthfully or um, not procrastinating, something like that, like kind of a big habit, 
you might use, need to use five, six, seven strategies simultaneously to really cement that habit into place, which sounds very hard, but is actually quite easy when you think about what all the 21 strategies are. Um, but usually it takes, you know, you really want to think it through. Um, you know, what is everything that I could throw at this behavior that's going to really, really help me follow through for myself consistently and for the long term? You know, anybody can do something for 30 days. You know, uh, anybody can do a 30-day yoga challenge. Anybody can train for the marathon. Anybody can give up sugar for Lent. But this is about doing something indefinitely. Um, So you have to really think about how to cement that habit into place. We can link to the 21 strategies so people can check those out. But what are the most common habits that you see that people really want to ingrain into their everyday life for happiness? Is there a common three maybe? Um, well, uh, yes, there is sort of the essential seven, um, which are the big sin uh, categories that just about every habit um, that people want to stick to, um, fall into this. And, you know, and, and when you, and when you talk to people, it's just like almost anything that people come up with is going to fall into these categories. So the first one is definitely to eat and drink more healthily. Um, that is a big thing for a lot of people and it takes different forms, you know, like some people want to drink less, some people want to quit sugar, some people want to cook more and not, you know, have not, not eat out so much or not have junk food or not have, um, fast food. Um, some people want to eat more vegetables, that kind of thing. Then another one is to exercise regularly. This is a top thing that I hear from people all the time because, you know, exercise is like the magical elixir of life. Um, Another is to save and spend wisely, you know, whether that's paying down debt or saving, donating to worthy causes, um, you know, staying, staying up to date with your expense reports, you know, everything related to that. Um, Another one is to rest, relax, and enjoy. This is an area where people want to, You know, they want to pursue their hobby instead of cruising the internet. You know, they want to be knitting or they want to be cooking or they want to be practicing an instrument instead of just like checking Facebook. Um, They want to get enough sleep. They want to spend less time in the car. Um, Another one is people want to stop procrastinating. They want to make consistent progress. So, you know, they want to do uninterrupted work or or, um, learn a language, have a blog, keep a gratitude journal, that kind of thing. A lot of people want to do things related to kind of simplifying, clearing, and organizing. You know, they want to get rid of clutter in their life. So maybe they want to make their bed every day. They want to put their keys away in the same place. They want to um, recycle more consistently. Um, And then finally, people have habits related to kind of engagement. They want to engage more deeply, whether that's with other people, whether that is with God, um, with, whether that's with yourself, you know, to d- have a deeper engagement with yourself or with the world, you know, um, maybe you want to volunteer, maybe you want to read the Bible every day, maybe you want to spend time in nature more often, maybe you want to have more time with friends, so you're going to do something like uh, start a book group or go to a reunion um, or, you know, say that you're going to have lunch away from your office at least once a week. Uh, have a um, date night with your sweetheart. So those are, I think, the essential seven because just about every habit that people want to have falls into those big seven categories. Okay, so they are the common things and we have the strategies to put those habits in place. And when you tune in, you can kind of play around with which ones feel best and work well for you. So the middle part there, what's stopping people? What is it that's stopping them from actually really either embedding that or um, even taking the steps? Well, that's the million dollar question. Um, And that's what I write about a lot in Better Than Before. It's like, why don't people? One of the things that I found as I was asking exactly that question, because I think that is the crucial question, you've really put your finger right on it, um, is um, how do you explain why people can and can't change habits? Sometimes habits happen easily. Sometimes they vanish overnight. Sometimes you try so hard to form a habit and you can't. Sometimes it's like it seems effortless, like what's going on? So I talk about a million different things in my book, Better Than Before, um, but I found one pattern a very large pattern 
um, that it's related to habits, but it's also much bigger than habits. It's a big pattern that makes um, a huge difference in how people view the world and how they engage with other people. And this is what I call the four tendencies. And this is uh, the way that I divide the whole world into four categories, upholders, questioners, obligers, and rebels. And this is one of the things, one of the strategies to think about of the 21 strategies and better than before. But so many people uh, deluged me with questions about the four tendencies once better than before it came out that I decided to write my whole next book about it. So my whole um, most recent book is called The Four Tendencies, and it's all about the four tendencies. And it really influences why you might struggle to form a habit, even though you really want to, based on your tendency. And so the tendency has to do um, with how you respond to expectations. And we all face outer expectations, which are things like a work deadline. And we all have inner expectations, which is things like, I really want to keep a New Year's resolution, or I really want to get back into practicing Italian. So there's upholders, questioners, obligers, and rebels. Upholders readily meet outer and inner expectations. So they meet the work deadline to keep the New Year's resolution without much fuss. Um, they want to, they're, they're very interested in meeting other people's expectations for them, but their expectations for themselves are just as important. Then there are questioners. Questioners question all expectations. They'll do something if they think it makes sense. So they hate anything arbitrary or inefficient or irrational. Um, so in, they make everything an inner expectation. So if it meets their inner standard, they will meet that expectation. If it fails their standard, they will resist it. Then there are obligers. Obligers readily meet outer expectations, but they struggle to meet inner expectations. And I got my insight into this tendency when a friend said to me, I don't understand it. I know I would be happier if I exercised. And when I was in high school, I was on the track team and I never missed track practice. So why can't I go running now? And in my view, when she had a team and a coach waiting for her, giving her outer expectations, she had no trouble doing it. But when it was only her own inner expectations, she struggled. And then finally, rebels. Rebels resist all expectations, outer and inner alike. They want to do what they want to do in their own way, in their own time. And if you ask or tell them to do something, they're very likely to resist. Now, most people can tell what they are just from that brief description. And not often they can tell who the people around them are as well. But there is a quiz online at happiercast.com slash quiz if somebody wants to take a quiz that will actually kind of diagnose them and tell them what their tendency is. But like I say, a lot of people don't need it. They, they can tell what they are. Could you be a mix between a few? Well, it's not really a mix, but like if I showed you the graph of it, you would see that the tendencies overlap with each other. So say I'm an upholder. I am an upholder. And upholders readily meet outer and inner expectations. So upholders overlap with questioners because both upholders and questioners readily meet inner expectations. So in that way, they have something in common. But upholders also overlap with obligers because they both readily meet outer expectations. So in that way, they have something really, um, that's that overlaps with obligers. So you can be kind of you can kind of tip. Like, are you an upholder who tips to questioner or an upholder who tips to an obliger? So, like, I'm an upholder who tips to questioner, and my husband is a questioner who tips to upholder. So, you see that we're very closely overlapping because um, we, there's a lot that's the same. Um, so, but you're not really two at once. I don't think that you're one at work and one at home. I don't think you're one at when you're 20 years old and you're one at your 40 years and one when you're 40 years old. I think these are really, it's like a, a deeply hardwired aspect of your personality. Um, though, of course, with time and experience, people learn how to manage their tendencies. Um, so they might not experience the downsides or weaknesses of their tendencies because they figured out kind of how to hack themselves and their situations. So um, it doesn't limit them. These four tendencies are great. And I believe awareness is key. When you're aware of which one you are, there's no hiding. You know, you're only hiding from yourself. So I think knowing what tendency you are is is key and crucial well exactly and and what's and and you're so right that like sometimes just even having a word for it kind of gives you clarity and and these aren't most supposed to be labels that limit your sense of sense of possibility or kind of like explain everything about you they're just supposed to illuminate maybe hidden patterns in your life or things that you didn't understand so, for instance, say obligers. Obligers are often really frustrated because they say, well, I meet everybody else's expectations for me, so why can't I meet my expectations for myself? And a lot of times they feel very frustrated by that, and they don't know how to fix it. Like, they really try to work on their inner motivation, or they really think about their priorities, 
And I'm like, yeah, that's not really going to work for you. What's going to work for you is outer accountability because that's what that's how obligers can meet expectations is when there's outer accountability in place. It's so easy to give yourself outer accountability. There are a million ways to give yourself outer accountability. And one of my favorite parts of writing The Four Tendencies was collecting the incredible, imaginative, resourceful strategies that um, obligers use to give themselves outer accountability um, once you realize that's what you need. But if you kind of can't diagnose the problem, then you don't know the right solution because it's like you might just be sort of flailing around trying this, trying that. And, you know, something that would work for a questioner isn't going to work for you. So maybe, yeah, maybe your sister-in-law had great success doing X, Y, Z thing, and it's not working for you. Well, it's not that she's better than you or there's something wrong with you. It's just you're just a different kind of person. It says something different is going to work better for you. Mm, Okay. This is so interesting. And once you know this, there's you can't really make any excuses, can you? Yeah. You know, it's interesting because sometimes people say to me like, well, I don't want, I don't want to be this tendency. How can I turn into a different tendency? And I'm like, all the tendencies include people who are big successes and also big, big losers. And there's no one tendency that's like the happiest tendency or the most successful tendency. The people that are the happiest, the healthiest, the most productive, the most creative are the people, like you say, who have self-awareness that who see who they are, who face their strengths and their weaknesses and, fig- and and kind of work around that. And you can only do that, as you say, when you're really well willing to have that self-awareness and to really think about, well, what is true for you? Because what's true for you, Melissa, is not necessarily going to be true for me, Gretchen. Um, maybe your experience is going to be interesting to me or could give me good ideas, but it's not necessarily going to work for me. And that's fine. You know, that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with me. Um, or that I'm not doing what I should be able to do. That's always a tip off. When people tell you, you should be able to do something, it's like, it doesn't matter what I should be able to do. What matters is what works. Um, So let's focus on that. Mm, Absolutely. So what makes you happy? Like, what do you do? What are your daily habits? Well, I'm a real morning person. And so I get up early in the morning. I take my dog out for a walk, which I lo- I enjoy because I like having that moment outside and experiencing the weather and seeing the sky. It kind of like gets me up and uh, up and around. And it's like fun to see my dog every morning. Um, and if you get up early, then you have to go to bed on time. So that's another thing that I do is I'm, I'm pretty much of a sleep zealot. Like I really try to make sure that I get enough sleep. Um, Another thing that makes me happy is just reading. I'm a huge reader. I really need to spend a lot of time reading. And so I make sure to carve out plenty of time in my schedule to read. Um, and one thing I do that's really fun is every Sunday night on on my Facebook page, I post a picture of all the books that I've read. I finished that week. Sometimes I, you know, it takes more than a week to read a book. Um, and that's really fun to sort of see. And then like, I can look back over the year and see, um, you know, I just look at the hashtag Gretchen Rubin reads and I'm like, Oh, look at all the books I read. It's so cool. Um, you know, being with my family and my friends, I'm, I'm a, the member of a lot of groups. I'm a big believer in the power of groups as a way to keep relationships strong, because instead of making like lots of one-off dates, you get together in a group. So like, I love children's literature for one thing. I'm in three groups of adults where we talk about children's literature because that's just something that I love. And it turns out there are all these super fun bookish people out there who also love children's literature. So that's just, again, that's something that many people would be like, why would you ever do that? But for me, that's super fun. Um, spending time with my family, my older daughter's getting ready to go to college. So that's something where I'm, I'm kind of thinking I've, I've been asking a lot of my readers and listeners for advice about how to handle this big transition for her, for me and my husband, for our younger daughter, who's going to be at home without her big sister. Um, and so that's been very helpful to get ideas about how to think in advance about something that could be a happiness challenge and try to mindfully approach it in a way, um, you know, to, to take that into account, not get blindsided by a situation. Um, and you know, I love to write and, you know, and, and I'm in this incredible position where I just write about whatever is most interesting to me. So, um, so I, I, um, I have a lot of, uh, a lot of happiness in my day-to-day life. Beautiful. I love what you say. You say that making your bed is a gateway to happiness. How so? 
Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, um, I think for most people, not for everybody, but for most people, maybe, uh, you know, at least many people, maybe most people, outer order contributes to inner calm. Uh, more really than it should, because something like an unmade bed is very trivial in the context of a happy life. But I just feel so much happier if my bed is made. It's just this little bit of order that I impose every day. Or actually, my husband and I have an agreement that whoever sleeps later has to make the bed. And because I usually get up with the dog, he's usually the one making the bed. But if he doesn't, I do. You know, our bed is always made. Um, I'll make my bed in a hotel room on the morning I check out. Like I just have to have, I, I can't be in a room with an unmade bed. Um, and I think for a lot of people, it just makes them happier. And of all the happiness resolutions that I've talked about, I mean, I wrote the happiness project. I wrote happier at home. I write about all these habits, but whenever I say to people, what have you done? What's made you happier? The number one thing that people specifically mention is to make their bed. But I will say there are some people who come up to me and they're like, I love not making my bed. I hate to make my bed. Or, you know, growing up, my mother made me make my bed every day. And now I'm a grown up and I don't have to. And every day I'm happy. I'm like, then great. Then not making your bed is what makes you happy. It's not something, it's it's only what works for you. There's nothing inherently um, uh, happiness generating about, I mean, maybe relationships. I think relationships do br- build happiness. Um, if you look at the people who are, ha- who are happy, they're the ones that have strong, enduring relationships. But most things, it's kind of like, well... Some people like to get up early and some people like to stay up late. Some people like to be in a really neat environment, but then there are some people who like to be in a messy environment. Some people like to have a lot of silence. Some people like to have a lot of bustle. Um, some people like to be in a big crowded cocktail party. Some people like to have coffee with a friend, you know, um, some people don't have a TV. Some people watch TV many hours a day. There's nothing, you know, it's all about figuring out what works for you, what makes you happier, what makes me happier. You know, I've spent so much time thinking about it. It's, um, it's been a great thing for me. Mm, and it's about bioindividuality, tuning in and looking at what it is, the things that do light you up and doing those, not comparing yourself to someone else and going, well, she likes rollerblading, so I'm going to do that. You know, it's about really tuning in and just going, well, what lights me up? And then do that daily. It's really quite simple, isn't it? You think, oh, it's so easy to know myself. I just hang out with myself all day long. But it can be hard to tell, partly because it's what we wish were true about ourselves or what we assume is true about ourselves or it's what other people think is true. Everybody loves skiing. Everybody loves drinking wine. Everybody loves shopping. Every what? Everybody loves games. I don't like any of those things. Um, but um, I don't like some of those things. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't really like music very much, um, which many people find shocking. I mean, I like a song here and there, but I, I'm not music oriented the way many people are. Um, but um, there are two questions that are really helpful. One is, what did you do for fun when you were 10 years old? Because something that you did when you were 10 years old is probably something that you would enjoy now. Um, and so you can kind of get a window into your your preferences and your interests and your values by thinking about what you did as a child. You know, were you walking in the park with your dog? Were you making arts and crafts? Were you writing short stories? Were you, um, you know, going biking with your friends? And, you know, think, can I bring that into my adult life if, if it's not there now? If you were playing, you know, I've talked to, speaking of music, I've spoken to so many people who music, playing in a band or a symphony or a school choir or whatever, and taking lessons and playing with friends and listening to music was a huge part of their life when they were younger. And they've just sort of drifted away from it. And this is a huge source of happiness that you could reclaim. You know, you can get that cello out of the back closet and start playing the cello again, and it could be a real source of happiness. Another more painful but very illuminating question is, whom do you envy? Envy is a very, very uncomfortable emotion. We often want to deny that we are feeling envious of somebody because it's very painful to admit, but actually envy is really, really helpful because if somebody has something, if you envy them, they have something you wish you had. And then you can think like, well, is there a way I could have that? And one of the best examples I saw of this was a friend of mine was being very critical of somebody that she worked with about the fact, oh, all she does is talk about these fancy trips she's taking and she's always going here and she's always going there. And she's always like saying this place is going to be great and, you know, going off and taking her vacation time to do these big trips. And finally I was like, I think you sound envious. I think you wish you were the one doing it. And she was like, 
oh my gosh, a hundred percent. You know, I have the same vacation time. I may, you know, I could do that with a little planning. I could go out of town. I could plan a trip. I could have an adventure. Why am I not doing it? And it's like, she realized that the envy was pointing her to something that she wanted. And she was very, it was very easy for her to incorporate that. Once she said to herself, you know, what's really missing from my life is travel. I always have loved to travel. And for some reason, you know, travel does take planning and energy and you kind of have to get yourself organized. And sometimes it's so much work to think about leaving town and, 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 and leaving work for a week or two, or even a day that you think, Oh, it's just easier not even to go and just stay here. But in the end, you know, that doesn't make you happier. And so she realized that her, the, the envy that she felt for somebody um, was a really important clue to what she wanted for her own life. Mm, that's, they're really good questions. Really good questions. I'm going to sit and ponder on those. So thank you for sharing that. I absolutely love your manifestos, which are basically power statements or affirmations that you live by. And there's a couple that I really love. One of them is, if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. And I agree, but there is such a negative connotation around the word failure. Why is that? And how can we change our mind about failure? Well, you know, that's something I had to work really hard on. And um, one of the things that helped me was to... um, the, the, the kind of the line from the manifesto that you just quoted, but also another one, which is to enjoy the fun of failure. Um, to really try to recast in my mind the idea of failure is something that's fun. It's an experiment. It's trying. This is just part of life. I can feel lighthearted about it. Um, and it was interesting because I was writing about it on my, on my site, GretchenRubin.com, and a commenter said, oh, no, you shouldn't think about it as failure. You should reframe it, and it's this and it's that. And at first I thought, oh, that's right. And then I thought, no, no, no. I don't want to pretend that I didn't fail. I don't want to pretend that there's something shameful or something that I can't acknowledge or, sh- or name it. Um, I just have to say part of, you know, if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. And like, that is just part of the process. And so I think really saying like, well, that didn't work, you know, and also for me, a really, really important thing has been every time there's something that I, I feel like, oh, wow, that didn't work out, is to try to figure out, well, what did I learn from it? And some of the most important things that I've learned and the things that have been the most powerful and the, the, and the things that have contributed to my success the most are things that grew out of a failure where I was like, okay, what is the lesson here? Uh, let's learn the lesson from this failure so that uh, like in the future, I can do something differently. Um, and so I think this idea of failing it's part of growth, you know, to be happier. We need an atmosphere of growth. We need to ha- be, feel like, like we're, we're changing or we're improving or we're learning or we're growing or we're helping somebody else to learn or grow or we're making something better. We're somehow contributing to the world moving forward. And sometimes that means failure because sometimes you get frustrated. You can't do something. You can't figure something out. You try something and despite your best efforts, it just fizzles or fails or, you know, uh, um, doesn't meet its mark. And that's okay because you can learn from that and you can enjoy the fun of it. Yeah, I agree. In my house, I've got an 11-year-old stepson and my husband, and we don't really use the word failure or mistakes. We just always say, well, what did what did we learn from this? Or how can we grow? And there's always a lesson. And every time we fall down, and it's if we don't get that lesson, we may have to repeat that failure again. So, it's always about just the awareness and asking yourself, what can I learn or how can I grow? Yes, absolutely. I think that's crucial. Another one of your manifestos that I love so much is it's important to be nice to everyone. And you have that in capital letters. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just, it's important to be nice to everyone. And um, it's part of being a good person. It's part of being happy. It's part of having self-command. Again, you know, back to this idea of having treats. When you feel comforted and cared for, when you feel like you have energy, it's easier to be polite to the person who cuts you off in traffic or steps in front of you in the drugstore line or the coworker who's a little bit late or kind of disorganized. You know, you have more patience, you have more sense of humor, you have more empathy, you have more, uh, more of a desire to help 
or to um, see how you could lend a hand. Um, because in the end, it is really important to, you know, to be nice to everyone. Yeah, I agree. And it's something that we can kind of get a little bit caught up in our own heads. And, you know, our world is all encompassing. But by just simply giving a smile to someone else, the getting is in the giving. And it's often those little times where I've just taken an extra 20 seconds to ask the lady at the post office how her day was and look up from my phone that I feel really full. And it, what, it took me 15 seconds to do. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, I'm curious to know now, what is one thing that you would like to improve or that you're currently working on within yourself at the moment? Well, in terms of there's sort of outer things and inner things. So, outer things like my sister and I have this podcast, Happier with Gretchen Rubin, which is super fun and, and we've had great success with it. But one of the things about like any kind of writing or any kind of creating creating things out there is you always want to be thinking, how do we up our game? How do we learn from what we've done? How do we do? How do we raise the bar on ourselves? So I think that's one thing. Um, it's so fun to do it with my sister. My sister is hilarious and brilliant. Um, I call her my sister the sage. So we want to like up the bar for happier with Gretchen Rubin podcast. Um, and you know I have a new book, and so part of it is like it's, it's, there's the fun of writing a book, which is really the most fun for me. That's what I like to do the most is to actually write a book. Um, but then there's supporting the book and getting the wor- the book out into the world. So I really am trying to like, think of, well, what is everything that I can do to spread my ideas and gay and engage with people? I've gotten so many great ideas and insights and examples from people. So really always staying open to that, always learning, always thinking about my model and how can I understand people better? How can I take into account all these people's experiences with it? And then for inner, like, as I said, you know, we're going through this big family transition. And so I really want to, in the short term, like stay calm about like the packing and the unpacking and the moving. And um, I can sometimes get kind of high strung and, uh, you know, short tempered. And so I'm really working on, uh, you know, staying calm and cheerful and letting this be a really fun transition for her and for us. Um, but also thinking about, well, how do we, how do I make something good out of this transition? Um, cause it's a new chapter in our family life. And one thing that I'm going to do is in, um, in my book, happier at home, I write about how, when my daughter Eliza went into middle school, I didn't ha- I, I just didn't spend as much time with her because she had more homework and she had more after school activities. And she often walked to school, um, and back by herself instead of walking with me. So I just was seeing her less. So We had a family tradition of every Wednesday, we'd pick her up from school and we would go off on an adventure. And now we called them adventures. They usually weren't very adventurous. We would like go to a museum together or like, you know, go do do something fun. Um, And then we, we would take turns picking. And I realized, well, we did that starting in seventh grade for her. And now my younger daughter is going into seventh grade. So this will be a whole new thing that I can do with my younger daughter. So some things are coming to an end, but some things are starting, you know, and so to think about how to view this as a new beginning and um, an exciting chapter in our family adventure um, instead of feeling that it's, you know, bittersweet because it really is also bittersweet. Um, and, uh, and I've talked to a lot of parents who have gone through it um, to sort of to, to anticipate what it's going to be like. Mm, that's really such a beautiful idea to do with your daughter. My husband and I have something a little similar. Uh, we do a thing called a seventure, which is a surprise slash adventure. And we block out time in our calendar for a seventure. And that might be, you know, going for a walk or going to the beach or taking each other out to lunch or something like that. Like just something really sweet, but we make sure we put it in our calendar. Otherwise it just doesn't happen. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So let's pretend now that you have a magic wand and you could put one book in the school curriculum of every single high school around the world. Now, despite all of your books, let's pretend they're already all in the curriculum (laughs) because they would be amazing. That's for sure. Especially for that age. My goodness. Uh, What book would you choose? I think I would choose Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Mm. It's a beautifully written book. It's a page turner. It's a memoir. So it teaches you about history. 
it is incredibly thought provoking about the nature of happiness and human nature. Um, it's an extraordinary story. Um, and I think it's something that everyone can learn from. It's a beautiful, uh, fascinating and accessible book. I think, you know, um, it's not something that like, I love Samuel Johnson. I love Samuel Johnson, but Samuel Johnson isn't for everyone. I wouldn't put that in every high school in the world because a lot of people just aren't going to get much out of Samuel Johnson. But I think most people could get something out of Victor Frankl. Mm, I agree. I loved that book so much. It just, yeah, like you said, it was a page turner. I just was like, oh my gosh, like, did that really happen? Like, it's just, yeah, it was crazy. Um, I often would read it just before bed and then I would go to bed and have dreams that I was in the Nazi concentration camps. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so vivid and haunting. Yeah, it is. Wow. Okay. So speaking of habits, let's talk about how your days look and do you have a morning routine? How does that look and how do you prime yourself for the day? You said you get up and you go outside and you take your dog for a walk, but is there any other uh, daily habits that you do to set yourself up for happiness and success? Well, it's funny because a lot of the a lot of the productivity experts will tell you that you should, especially if you're a morning person who has like a lot of mental alertness early in the day, you shouldn't begin your day by doing email because that's sort of a low intellect thing. But I found that I just can't settle down to demanding intellectual work until I've checked my email and sort of checked all my social media. Like I sort of have to see what's going on. So I do that first. And then if I do have something, like let's say I have an email that's very tricky to write, or I have to review a document that's going to take a lot of concentration, um, or you know somebody's asked me to do something that's going to that's that I feel like it's going to be very uh, kind of taxing, I will save that and do it first thing in the morning because I am somebody who starts out at my most fresh, and so I and and, it, and for me that helps me also. Um, organized work. Cause I'm like, well, I'm not going to do it now because I'm feeling a little bit tired. I'm going to do that first thing in the morning. I know it's going to get done and it'll get done at a time where I'm kind of at peak efficiency. So I do that. And then I go into a day, you know, I'm, I love habits and I kind of wish that I could create a life where my day, every day would unfold exactly the same way. That sounds like heaven to me. I'm an upholder and upholders often like, uh, schedules. Um, but, uh, but it's, but I, you know, I'm a writer and so I might have an interview that I'm doing with some journalist. I might, um, be writing a blog post. I might be going to a studio to record my podcast. I might be traveling. I might be speaking. I might have a school function. Um, you know, I have like a million different things. And so, um, but what I do is if I am at the period in my life where I am working on a book, I will try to have three hours where I'm working on that book um, only. Um, now, I might be able to do it in a, you know three hours at a stretch. I might have to do like an hour and a half before lunch and an hour and a half after lunch. But I try to have three hours where I'm really – I often there's a little library right near my house, and I'll often take a laptop and go there so that I'm away from my three monitors and social media and my email and all that and the phone – um, and I'll just go and like work in this very quiet stacks with all these books around me. I find that very, like, that's a very um, compelling environment for me. So, and it's just a block away. So I'll go there and work there while I'm doing original writing. Um, and then every day, almost every day I write on my blog. So that's like a daily writing that I have to do, which is good. You know, I think for writers, writing constantly is good, keeps you in that mode of writing and producing. Um, and then it's the sort of, and then, you know, um, and then that's my work day. Oh, and I usually walk my daughter to school. Um, she she can walk by herself, but I just like to do it. So my work day starts after that. And then I go to the gym. You know, I one day I have a yoga class. One day I have a high intensity weight training class. Sometimes I go to the gym. If it's nice outside, I'll go for a walk in the park. You know, um, I sort of have these things that I plug in in different ways, uh, depending on circumstances and what else is going on. You can really tell that you have sat with yourself and tuned in and asked yourself what really lights me up and what makes me happier. And you just know because you can just rattle those off really, really quickly. And I think a lot of people haven't really taken the time to just sit with themselves and ask themselves what lights them up. Yeah. And it's a really important question. If you don't have self-awareness, then you can't figure out what those would be for you. 
Um, you might know what sort of like are some popular choices, but this might be something that would light you up or maybe not. Mm. Okay. I would love to hear now, what are three things you are most recently grateful for? I am a massive fan of gratitude. So I'd love to hear three things that you're most recently grateful for. I'm grateful that my for the fact that my daughter seems excited about going to college. She doesn't seem anxious about it. She seems excited. So that's great. Um, I'm grateful for, I have an amazing team working on my book and that's so, I'm so grateful to them every day because it's just, it really helps me get my ideas out into the world and to do a lot of things that I wouldn't be able to do on my, by myself. And it's like having people who are really creative and consistent and reliable and responsible. I'm great. You know, I, I'm constantly writing thank you in all capital letters, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point to the people who are helping me. Cause there's a lot when, you know, when a book comes out, there's a lot of work in a lot of different ways. It's, it's, this is like a lot, um, a lot, it's just a lot easier when you have really able people helping you. And so I so appreciate all the people who are helping me. And then, you know, I'm grateful for New York City. I love New York City. Every day I walk out, you know, I'm from Kansas City, Missouri, which is uh, which is a city that I love. I was just home visiting my parents with my family. I love Kansas City, a beautiful, wonderful um, city, but there's nothing like New York. And I just feel so lucky that I get to live here. And I never take it for granted. Um, uh, just like walking down the street, I'm always seeing something that I've never seen before. I've never noticed before. There's some like little weird thing happening, some funny encounter. And so, um, so that's something that I'm always grateful for. Mm, Beautiful. Okay. I've got three rapid fire questions for you. Oh, I love rapid fire questions. (laughs) In your opinion, what is one of the most important things that we can do for health? Well, in my view, which is not a view that everybody holds, is I would say quit sugar. I mean, I'm one of these crazy low-carb people. I really, I don't eat sugar. I don't eat flour. I don't eat rice. I don't eat starchy vegetables. For the most part, I don't eat much fruit. Um, I really avoid sugar and carbs. And it has just made me feel so much healthier. Um, And also, I had a tremendous sweet tooth, and that just went away. You know, like now that I don't eat that stuff anymore, it just doesn't bother me. It's not noise in my head. I don't have to resist it. I don't have to fight temptation. It's just, it's just over. Um, so I love it. I'm not saying that's would work for everyone, but I kind of do think it would work for everyone if everybody wanted to do it. So for me, that has been one of the most important things that I feel like I've done for my health. Mm, mm, I agree. I did the same thing many years ago and have never felt better. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm on my third or fourth year now and it just gets easier. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And what is one of the most important things that we can do for more wealth? So this is more abundance in all areas of your life and yes, in your finances and yes, in your career, but just being abundant in every area. Give to others. You know, even giving away money tends to seems seems they've done research that it seems to increase, increase wealth and it certainly makes you happier. Um, to, you know, give to causes that you support or to, you know, help people who need help. One of the best ways to make yourself happy is to make other people happy. So um, helping others. Mm, I love that. And what is one of the most important things that we can do for more love? Well, you know, one of the th- resolutions, and I write about this in Happier at Home, we we decided on this as a family resolution, and that is to give warm greetings and farewells every time we came and went from the apartment. So every time we come and go, somebody people really say hello. They come to you, they give you a hug or a kiss, and they really acknowledge the fact that you're coming or going instead of just sort of grunting at a hello from across the room or, you know, reading the newspaper, whatever. And you can do this at work too, which is don't just like, you know, ignore your coworkers as they come in the morning, but really say hello, really acknowledge that someone's coming in. And this just dramatically increases your sense of engagement with other people. It makes you feel recognized. It makes other people feel recognized. And that really does. I, I was astonished by how much that changed the loving atmosphere of our home without much, you know, it's not much work or time or effort um, made a big difference. Mm, and so simple. Yep. 
Very simple. Mm, I'm going to take that one and I'm going to make sure, I'm going to tell my husband and my little boy and we're going to implement that into our life. Great. Excellent. Excellent. Let me know how it works out. I will. I will. And finally, Gretchen, what is one thing that I personally and the listeners today can do to serve you? Oh, well, check out my stuff. I love hearing from listeners and readers. So you can check out my blog at GretchenRubin.com. You can listen to my podcast, Happier with Gretchen Rubin. You can check out my book, The Four Tendencies. Um, And then, you know, let me know what you think. What do you think about happiness? What do you think about habits? What's your tendency? What have you found about yourself, working with yourself, working with other people? Um, That would be great. I, I, I I love engagement. Yeah, awesome. I will definitely be checking out some of your other books and diving deep into them. And before we wrap up, I just want to acknowledge you and thank you for the work that you do. This has been an amazing episode and and so simple and tangible. And that's what we want. We don't want to complicate things. We just want things to be as simple to digest. And then it's about taking the action. So thank you so much for uh, doing all the research on happiness and for sharing it with us today. Oh, well, thank you so much. It was I was so happy to get the chance to talk to you. Me too. So thank you and we'll speak soon. Thank you. That was awesome. So simple and practical, which I love and which we all want. We don't want to complicate things too much, do we? We just want it to be easy to implement into our everyday life. Now, one thing I'm definitely going to implement is the warm welcome and farewells, not only into my home, but in all of my relationships. So I want to encourage you to try it out too and let me know how you feel and how it goes for you in the show notes. And please subscribe and leave me a five-star review because that means we can inspire even more people together to live happier and healthier lives. And don't forget to tell me on Twitter who you would like me to interview and make sure you tag me at Mel underscore Ambrosini and the person you want me to interview using the hashtag the Melissa Ambrosini show. And for everything that we mention in today's podcast, you can check out in the show notes and that is at melissaambrosini.com forward slash 37. And you can check out all my other podcasts there too. Thank you so much for being here, for wanting to be the best and happiest version of yourself and for showing up today for you. You rock. Now, if there's someone in your life that you can think of that would really benefit from this episode, please share it with them right now. Do whatever you've got to do to get them to listen to it because it's my mission to make everyone feel happier and healthier. And until next time, my darling, don't forget that love is sexy, healthy is liberating, and wealthy isn't a dirty word.